A potential civil war in the United States isn't something I really want to discuss on my channel. Nevertheless, a recent poll found a plurality of Americans, around 46%, believe a future civil war is likely. There are multiple hot-button issues pressing into the everyday American discord, from election legitimacy to vaccines and mass mandates everywhere you turn. As a prepper, we try to see the bigger picture. When the media starts running stories about the potential for civil war, and polls show nearly half of Americans think we're heading toward one, it would be wise to prep for that possibility. What could a civil war look like today? What are the political divisions and other divisions driving us apart? Can we change our course at this point? Is there anything you can do right now? We'll try to answer those questions in this video. Download the Start Preparing Survival Guide to help you prepare for any disaster. I'll post a link in the description and comment section below or visit cityprepping.com forward slash get started for a free guide to help you get started on your journey of preparedness. Civil War Today First of all, today's civil war would look wildly different from the Civil War of the 1860s. Many Americans cannot conceive of a civil war today because they're thinking about the first one. We're different people. Our country is more developed and intertwined. When the South succeeded, the United States military was only 16,000 soldiers strong and was primarily engaged in fighting indigenous people in the West. It was easy for the South to believe that they could win. Most of all, though, our ancestors didn't have a 24 hours news cycle on social media. Some would say that America was never indeed a democracy. Others would argue that we are very specifically a constitutional republic. I won't argue either of those points, and I think both stances will generally agree that whatever we were, we are definitely leaning or solidly standing in an anocracy or semi-democracy that is a stage of government that is loosely defined as part democracy and part dictatorship or as a regime that mixes democratic with autocratic features. Perhaps we're more deeply divided than we've ever been, with different values and goals. Groups on both polar extremes would willfully contribute to and gleefully cheer for the dismantling of the current mechanisms and figureheads of government for some other, unknown form of governance. Battles under the banners of individual rights and state rights rage on and intensify, with each side claiming the moral and most patriotic high ground. Wherever a vocal enough or armed and feeling self-righteous minority is allowed to emerge, there will be conflicts. Capitol buildings will be seized. Protests in the streets will occur. Some would argue that the first shots of this civil war were fired on January 6. Others would say that the events of that day were merely democracy in action, as an angry group of patriots sought to correct injustices. Any future civil war here in the United States will begin as a struggle between federal and state levels. This will likely not lead to the level of outright succession initially. States are, after all, tied to the teats of federal funding, and the military far outnumbers any state power militia. However, seeing some states run errantly of federal legislation and policy, and tying up the court systems to force policies from their own defined angle is highly likely. Our national level divisions will solidify around our regional divisions, from ignoring vote counts to ignoring Supreme Court rulings. If the divisions continue and the parties can peacefully decide on a division of resources, we could be looking at a reformation of the American states. Our great union would be divided into North, South, East, and West regions under the same umbrella, but differently ideologically aligned in government. It all sounds familiar to a dystopian writing as portrayed in the recent book, The Hunger Games. Political Divisions Politics have increasingly become mainstream entertainment for the masses. As such, it lacks considerable substance if we assume it had any to begin with. Two clearly defined political camps compromise the most significant divisions. These are whipped into a frenzy by 24-hour partisan broadcasting and posting machines, I won't call it news here, and social media propaganda and misinformation. Both of these favor sound bites over thoughtful analysis. Both of these thrive on creating a frenzy over finding common ground. Anywhere you turn today, you will find a highly charged argument that has only two positions that are at a complete opposite of each other. There is no compromise, and the opposition is often belittled or dehumanized for even offering a counterpoint or different opinion. Each side seeks only black and white, and accepting any shade of gray is capitulation. Sometimes even listening to or allowing others to speak differing opinions is a sign of lacking sufficient loyalty and fealty to the party. Statements are taken out of context and amplified through internet memes and 24-hour commentary by pundits who barely understand the core issues themselves. Politicians and foreign adversaries seize upon this divisiveness. They boost it with every opportunity for both sport and profit until they often repeat sound bites that they don't even believe. 
Consider these following issues I'm about to list out. Each of these issues are making the circuit in the American media outlets at the moment, and based upon which outlet you gravitate toward, the story is spun differently. For example, there are too many guns or not enough guns in the right people's hands. There are too many people crossing our border, or there isn't a clear path to citizenship. Too many people abuse the social safety nets, or not enough of a social safety net exists. There's voter fraud, or there aren't enough voter rights. There's too much body autonomy, or not enough. There's too much government, or not enough. There's a need for infrastructure, or the money is being wasted. There should be more religious autonomy, or there should be a greater separation between church and state. There should be more taxes on corporations than the rich, or there should be fewer taxes. There's a global warming trend, or there are alarmist models that are driving economic pain with no environmental gain. Our military is being made weaker, or we spend far too much on a defense budget. People are working too hard, or they aren't working hard enough and are living off handouts. Millennials this and boomers that. Which side of these statements did you feel aligned with your views? Did the opposing view upset your position? It's statements like these that Americans are being forced into corners to decide on. Any capitulation is seen as weakness and cowardice. There can be no middle ground. We are then asked, which America will you choose? And failing to choose the right way will result in the end of America as we know it. We are told that we must make a choice and we must vote. We are told that our vote counts, doesn't count, matters, and doesn't matter. You're advised to wear a mask or get a vaccine for the public good, or your rights and body autonomy are being violated. You are told there is no pandemic, or there is a pandemic. We are told to wake up, and we are told that we are too woke. We are told there is a war raging between good and evil. We are told that some are treasonous and others are patriots. You are told you are being robbed and persecuted, exploited and betrayed. Are you feeling overwhelmed yet? Welcome to America today. Anywhere you turn, you are bombarded. You are being told to make a decision now to avoid a sure death. Is it any wonder so many younger generations are tuning it all out and searching for personal alternatives? Is it any wonder, with all these issues portrayed as life or death decisions, that temperatures are rising and tempers are flaring? There is a retreat from a substantive debate in favor of name-calling and ad hominem attacks, a loss of the ability to receive and evaluate information in favor of punditry, susceptibility to propaganda, imagery, and sound bites, and an acceptance of non-vetted and uncorroborated statements in place of research and supported information. Perhaps you feel one of these issues I outlined is so essential and all-consuming that we cannot as a country possibly move forward until it is decided. That's fine. I'm only merely pointing them out. I'm not taking a personal stand on any of them here, nor am I asking you to do so. Regardless of where you stand, even a casual observer can note that politicians in the mainstream media stoke the fires of these two camps for their enjoyment, gain, and profit. Politics has become, or perhaps always was, a game of charisma and one-upmanship. Politics are entertainment and sport in the Coliseum. The chance of either party agreeing to function in a bipartisan manner or legislating their way collectively out of the civil war we are barreling toward is slim to none. Creating Opposition If our political differences weren't enough, another stratum of division is between the old and the young. You have probably heard jokes about boomers and millennials and every generation between, before, and after. The fact is that we are living longer as a culture, and individuals are ego-based. It's hard for a boomer to grasp the new struggles and challenges of a millennial or younger. It's equally challenging for a millennial or younger to buy into a system they fundamentally see as self-serving and broken. One seeks to hold on to a system that is constantly changing. The other seeks to change a system it sees as continually failing. This struggle has been around in America, at least since the 60s and the Cultural Revolution of that time. Still, it is different from that era, and perhaps it is also more extreme because people live longer and widen that gap. Here, I like to see this through Eric Erickson's theories of psychosocial development. Many under the age of 30 have a sort of industry versus inferiority, where they either feel encouraged and reinforced for their initiative, and they begin to feel industrious or competent. Of course, this can only happen if jobs are out there for them to have that can equally pay the bills, maybe even allow them to purchase a house, and put food on the table from one person's income like the boomers did before them. In November of 2021, a record 4.5 million Americans quit or changed their jobs. So to say some disillusionment existed would be an understatement. If this life and career growth are not encouraged, then the 30 and under will feel inferior, doubt their abilities, give up, and drop out of the system. This is why so many younger people don't bother to vote. 
Here I am applying one of Erickson's stages typically used for a child's age bracket, but I think it also applies here. Now on the other hand, the older generations are on the opposite end of that spectrum, typically over 60 years of age or more. Here Erickson's theory of generativity versus stagnation seems most appropriate. Here the person gives back or feels they have already given back to society through raising children, being productive at work, and being involved in community activities and organizations. Through generativity, people develop a sense of being a part of the bigger picture. They can also become defensive of traditional ways and resistant to new ideas of ways of doing things. The differences between the age groups are significant, and politicians and others stoke the conflicts between them for their enjoyment, gain, and profit. There's also a massive division between the haves and have-nots. The income inequality in America has never been as gaping during a corresponding time where self-sufficiency skills have been replaced by dependence on global supply chains. People can't afford what they need and have forgotten the skills to harvest from nature and make it for themselves. There are also obvious ethnic disparities in the United States. There is a division between the ordinary citizen and the ruling class. Cultural elitists are perceived to have too much control given to them by large population centers on the coastal regions, just as rural states with far fewer citizens are believed to have too much outsized power over the policies regulating the whole country. Just about any line you draw these days is characterized by a widening gap. So too, with any civil war, it is characterized by the emergence of factions. So, deep seeds of division are planted and cultivated in these ways. It's not likely that anyone will change anyone else's way of thinking. Whether these seeds are tended to and fertilized from within ideological camps, by politicians and pundits, or by foreign adversaries who would love to see America retreat from the world stage to tend to its own garden, it doesn't really matter at this point. It's not likely that there will be a massive, nonpartisan initiative to legislate our way to a more straightforward path. The infusions of evangelism and counterculture rebellion only add additional fertilizer to these seeds of division. So, are we on a course that will find us so divided that succession, revolution, armed insurrection, socialism, or autocratic governance are the only options remaining? What can avert these outcomes? Are we already there and beyond the tipping point? Sidestepping Civil War It was Ronald Reagan who once said, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we are facing an alien threat from outside this world. The same is true for American divisiveness. Both divisions can politicize an event like a recession, natural disaster, even a pandemic. Even though the death toll may be high, once the divisions are deeply rooted enough, the event just fuels the growth. To unite the American people, an event so threatening and grand that it distracts us from our differences, it has to happen. The collective shock after Pearl Harbor or 9-11 united us around a common enemy. This allowed us to put aside some of our differences to coalesce around a common contempt and need for revenge. It is possible that an equally significant event like these could unite us for a brief moment and stabilize us. War with China or Russia over Ukraine sovereignty or territorial disputes in the South China Sea, respectively, might rally enough of both ideological extremes to bring them slightly closer together. It could, however, just drive a deeper wedge between the old guard and the disenfranchised younger generations. A booming economy with record low unemployment and abundance of opportunity might collectively calm the masses, but with rising inflation, that isn't likely to occur either. A nuclear Iran or a blustering North Korea might bring us closer together. From my perspective, we're currently living through the watershed event, COVID-19. If our country gets ahead of it and appears to be fading by the middle of this year, collectively, our feelings of stress and tension will be replaced with relief and optimism for the future hopefully. Both camps will claim the profit, of course. Historically, the decline of every civilization was also accompanied by uncontrollable pestilence. Barring an event that would bring us together, I don't really see a means to sidestep the inevitable, and we will continue barreling towards autocracy, plutocracy, or what I outlined earlier as civil war today. Countries worldwide that have managed to sidestep civil war did so by instituting significant political reforms and strengthening their democracy. With such partisan division and every statement and action amplified online and on the air, it might no longer be feasible for any one party to implement significant political reform ample enough to change our current course. What can you do? There isn't anything you, I, or we collectively can do to alter the current course, in my opinion. The best we can do is not feed the machine of divisiveness and focus on our own preparations for surviving. It was a political satirist, Voltaire, who soberly put it that, one must cultivate one's own garden. 
I would encourage you to look at the effects of civil war and civil discords in the streets. I've seen the effects of war firsthand living in Afghanistan in 2003. The many stories I heard from locals seeing family members murdered in front of their eyes and watching others die due to the lack of medical care was heartbreaking. Many of our viewers can attest to the impact of a country's decline, such as in Syria, Yugoslavia, Sri Lanka, Yemen, Venezuela, and the former Soviet Union, and other countries worldwide. Nobody remains unaffected by war and extreme civil discord. Whether they are in a city, a suburb, or the rural countryside, nobody remains untouched by war and extreme conflict. No matter where you are, don't put your faith in others to solve the present crisis, as they aren't likely to be able to alter our current course. Instead, practice the principles of prepping. Cultivate self-sufficiency. Return to your roots to grow some of your food. Or learn a new skill and free yourself from overdependence on a system that will be one of the first casualties of a more significant conflict. Undoubtedly, the next few months and years will be replete with everything from conflicts in the streets to potentially domestic terrorism truck bombs like in Oklahoma City in 1995, or the less ideological motivated bombing in Asheville in 2020. Without a doubt, we will see a continuation of civil unrest in the streets we witnessed from 2016 through 2020. We'll also see an escalation of these outpourings as each faction gets increasingly more aggressive toward each other, emboldened by their sense of right and cheered on by their ideological camps. You should focus on your timelines. Prep for three days, then three weeks, then three months of more of survival and self-sufficiency. The longer you can wait out the conflict, the more likely it will burn through all its fuel without you being caught up in the consuming fire. If the system is going to fill, if the rope you're climbing up the mountain with is likely going to snap, the less tied to it you are, the more likely you are to survive. That is true for any disaster, from a supply chain failure to a hurricane or riots in the streets to violent civil war. What you can do is increase your water and food reserves to last an absolute minimum of three weeks if you're new to preparedness, preferably three months or more. Prepare to lay low and protect what you have. If you find yourself with a minority voice of opinion in your community, you have to decide whether you can stay there or you should make an early exit to some place where your specific values are more respected. Sure, get out there in your community and encourage the voting process or canvas for your favorite candidate if that is your thing. But try to minimize public expressions of your beliefs so as not to make yourself a target if civil conflicts arrives at your doorstep. Probably the best thing you could do is not to engage in the fires. Turn off social media that only amplifies and encourages division through calculated algorithms. Turn down the volume around you. Sidestep the arguments in favor of positive interactions on other subjects. Turn off the pundits and commentators and commentary that will tell you that you must decide or die. If you deprive these argumentative combatants and media profiteers of their audience, they will have to find something else to talk about. Focus on your own garden. By doing so, you rob the fires of the Civil War of the fuel it needs. I have heard it said that we are already engaged in a cold Civil War. We can all agree that there is a battle that is raging on for your attention. Whether you choose to be a part of that battle or you actively seek to avoid and defuse a battle is entirely up to you. Whatever you decide, however, get your preps in order. This will very likely intensify even more before we see any light of peace and tranquility again. What do you think? Is there a division that I've overlooked? Do you think that this is all hype or are we in a genuine danger of passing a point of no return? Or have we already crossed that point? Let us know in the comments below. I try to read me in the comments and respond to them when I can, and that's typically within the first hour of releasing a video. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you'd like to be notified when I release a video. And please give this video a thumbs up to help the channel grow. As always, stay safe out there.